والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم بسم الله الحمد لله you're watching way of the muslim defining the muslim character based on the teachings of muhammad the last and final prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam peace be upon him I'm Yusuf Estes, your host, and for the next few minutes, we'd like to read for you some of the teachings of Muhammad translated to the English language and see what we can gain for the development of some good character for the Muslims. The first one is a story, hadith, narrated on the authority of Omar, radiallahu anhu. He tells us that the Prophet Muhammad said that actions are but by intention. And that there is for every person only that which he intended. So that he who made migration for Allah and his messenger, then that's what his migration is for, Allah and his messenger. And he whose migration was to attain some worldly goal or to take a woman in marriage, then his migration was that for which he migrated. This particular teaching is a very valuable one for Muslims and it helps us to understand even some very important, essential things in our belief system. And that is that it is by intention that everything is being graded by Allah Almighty. We know that as Muslims, there is something called the Qadr or the predestination of Allah. Some people might ask the question, well, if there's predestination, then everything's already written. So what is the benefit for me to do good or bad? It's all written anyway. And why should I be punished or rewarded? But by understanding this teaching, it makes it clear. You're not being judged according to the outcome of things as much as you're being judged by your intention. That each and every one of us should always have the very best intention for what we do. And it wouldn't be right that a person could all of a sudden just say, well, the outcome was good, therefore I'll say that I did it, even though they didn't have any intention to do it to start with. I can give you maybe an example of that. Before Muslims pray, we make something called wudu, which is to wash up before we pray. Now, if a person needed to do that, and they were on their way to the prayer, and then they remembered, oh, I didn't do this ceremony of washing and I need to do that, but I don't have time. And then suppose he fell in the swimming pool. When he came out of the swimming pool and he said, Oh, now I'm all wet, therefore I have this ablution or wudu. And that wouldn't be right. Because he didn't have the niya or intention for this. Then any time a person is trying to do a bad deed and he succeeds in doing it, then he would be punished for it. But here's something really beautiful about Islam that the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, taught us that there is an angel on the right side who records all of our good deeds and one on the left side that records the bad deeds. The beautiful part is that whenever you intend to do a good deed, then this one has already started recording and you have a good deed recorded for you already. Then when you accomplish the good deed, you're recorded Ten like it so that you have ten good deeds. But when you intend to do a bad deed, but you stop yourself from doing it, this one writes down a good deed. Why? Because you stop somebody, meaning yourself, from doing a bad deed. And then if a person intends to do a bad deed, and he does the bad deed, then the angel on this side begins to write, but the angel on this side stops him and says, wait a minute, maybe he will repent for that. So after a time, then this one starts to write again. And then this angel says, wait a minute, maybe he'll repent for that. Until finally, if he doesn't repent, then it will re be recorded one full bad deed. Now that's a bargain no matter where you, you look at it because if I can get ten good deeds for doing a good deed here, but only get a bad one over here, that's, that's really going to help. But it didn't stop there. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said to follow up a bad deed by doing a good deed. So the teaching here now that we see in, regarding intentions is, number one, always have good intentions. Try your best from the very beginning of every day. 
to have a good intention of what you're going to do. But along the way, when you have some bad intentions, stop yourself before you do it. And remember, that will also get you a good deed. But if you do something bad, as soon as you can, then you need to repent for that. You need to atone for that. And the way to atone for it is what? As the Prophet Sassan taught us, to do a good deed to make up for a bad deed. And this deals with the subject now of intentions. I want to read to you another hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu taught us. He said, and this is according to the son of Omar, this is Abdullah ibn Omar, and he said that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, passed by a man from the Ansar. These were the helpers in Medina. And this man was admonishing his brother about being shy because his brother was maybe too shy. The messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, leave him alone. Because modesty is a part of faith or Iman. And this is recorded in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari. And then Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says that the Prophet sallallahu peace be upon him, said that Iman, faith, has 60 odd or 70 odd branches. The uppermost of these branches is the testimony of faith to say that there is none worthy to be worshipped except Allah meaning that he doesn't have any partners. Well, the least of these branches of faith is the removal of a harmful obstruction or object from the road. And he said also shyness is a branch of Iman. What we noticed from both of these teachings is a focus here on being shy. It appears today that the general public is anything but shy. There's another hadith of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that you hear many, many, many times. And that is when he said that every child is born on the natural inclination of Islam or the fitra of Islam. This means that the way a child is, the innocence of a child, is the way that everybody is supposed to be when they're in Islam. And that shyness that a child has is naturally given to them by Almighty God. And this is something that we really love. It's highly appreciated in Islam for this quality or virtue of shyness. It's something so encouraged in Islam that we have books on the subject. We have topics that you can uh, find online dealing with this quality shyness. On the opposite side of the coin, we find that the non-Muslim sources, many times when you watch television and things that are well, I don't want to say how bad they can get, but you notice that some of these television shows that the children are not being shy, they're being the opposite. Let me explain. Suppose you see a child in a TV show and it's supposed to be funny. He's making fun of his father, making fun of his mother, talking harsh against them. You know, where they put their hand on their hip and ha, 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 talk in their parents' face. And these shows have a tendency to take away the shyness of the child. And that's why we highly recommend this type of viewing, these types of programs that you're watching right now, because it will help develop the right kind of character for your children. We want to bring out, pull out this shyness because it's something good. It's not just for little girls to be shy. It's even for grown men, as we just heard from this hadith and teaching in Islam. A person should be shy. And what are we talking about with shyness? This is something that when you are in front of other people, that you are quiet and you're peaceful within yourself. It doesn't mean that you're bashful to the extent that you can't speak. After all, I'm speaking in front of many people right now. And this isn't the idea of being shy. But it's being shy to bring up certain things or to be shy to hurt somebody's feelings. Because all of this is a part of Islam, the way that we treat each other. So it's a shyness in your dealing with the people, shy to hurt someone, shy to overstep certain bounds, and shy in front of Allah. Because this is a good quality for the Muslims, as we've just learned from this hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. Now, when we talked about the one hadith, the second one, it mentioned that the the first of the branches is la ilaha illallah. And that, again, we can say that it's right to be shy in front of Allah. Whenever we say la ilaha illallah, there's none to worship except Allah. 
then we realize at the same time we should be shy in front of Allah. And when we do, as the Hadith mentions, remove obstructions or objects out of the way of the people, we shouldn't be so boastful and so proud that we would be uh, saying, I'm not going to remove this. Who am I? Do I look like the trash man? I'm not going to do that. No, be shy to the extent that I have no problem to pick this up and move it out of the way of the people. And this is something good. The opposite is to be boastful, to be proud. And the Prophet ﷺ taught us that if a person is having even a grain, a mustard seed, a tiny amount of pride, you know, boastfulness, that they will not enter into the paradise. The word in Arabic for this boastfulness is called kibr. But we know as Muslims, only Allah is Akbar, which means great, the greatest of great. So we shouldn't try to be boastful or have this kind of attitude in front of Allah. We should be shy, be shy and be humble in front of Almighty God. And this is a beautiful teaching from the gems that we've learned here from this uh, teachings of the shyness from Prophet Muhammad The next one I would like to mention to you is on the authority of Thabit. And he tells us that Anas says that the Prophet, peace be upon him, came to me while I was playing with some boys. And the Prophet greeted us and sent me on an errand. This delayed my return to my mother. And when I came to her, she said, where have you been? And I said, I've been on an errand for the Prophet Muhammad. She said, well, what was the errand that you were supposed to do? He said, well, it was a secret. His mother said, don't tell this secret to anyone because this is not right to tell secrets when they're given to you like this. So Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, said to Thabit, by Allah, he's swearing, if I were to tell it to anybody, I would have told it to you. And obviously he didn't. So this is again referring back to this high quality of what? Being shy to even disclose the secret because when you're given a secret, this is a trust and you don't want to break a trust. And even if your mother said, well, what's the secret? You don't tell it because it's a secret. It's a very good thing in Islam that a person is able to keep to themselves the proper things that are to be kept secret. Now we want to come to the next one. And this one is dealing with hypocrisy. And hypocrisy, in Arabic is called nifaq, and one who has it is munafik. The Prophet, uh, peace be upon him, is reported to have said, this is from Abu Huraira, by the way. He says that the Prophet ﷺ said, three are the signs of a hypocrite. When he speaks, he lies. When he makes a promise, he breaks it. And when he's trusted, he betrays the trust. And to go into depth on these three things, I want to take a break, let you reflect on that, then come back and we want to pick up with this important subject when we talk about the way of the Muslim and how we have the character and development of the Muslim. And we'll be back right after this. <laughs> Bismillah, alhamdulillah, we're back. You're watching The Way of the Muslim, Defining the Muslim Character. When we left off, we were talking about the subject of hypocrisy because the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had taught us something amazing about people who have this disease. And I'd like to mention that hadith to you again. It's on the authority of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, and he said that there are three signs of a hypocrite. When he speaks, he lies. And when he makes a promise, he breaks it. 
And when he's trusted with anything, he betrays his trust. Now, I want to tell you another one that's similar to that. This one comes from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Alas. And he says that the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us that there are four things that if you find them inside of a person, this will make him a complete hypocrite. And the one who possesses one of these possesses a characteristic of hypocrisy until he leaves it. And these are, and I mentioned the four, that whenever you entrust him with something, he betrays the trust. Whenever he speaks, he lies. If he makes a promise, he acts treacherously. And when he argues, he argues in a way that's very impudent and very insulting in manner. So let's look at both of these teachings of Muhammad together and realize that hypocrisy is something very much against the teaching of Islam. So a person should exhibit what is in their heart and not the other way around. That they would show something that's not in their heart. Because when you think about it, a lie is what? And I want to talk to you just for a minute about a lie. Do you realize that if a person lies to someone, he's actually telling two lies? Yes, because in order to, for me to say a lie to you, I first have to lie to myself. And I have to say, hey, it's okay for me to tell a lie. And it's not. So when a person tells a lie, then the next thing that happens is what? He begins to try to think of a way to cover up that lie. And cover up that lie. And then cover that lie. Until he's lied so much. And the prophet, peace be upon him, taught us about lying. He said that whenever a person lies, there's this black speck on their heart. And they continue lying until they put so much black on it, the whole thing is black. So this is something we definitely want to avoid. I know sometimes they say, well, it's only a white lie. It's a small lie, you know. But in reality, lying is against the teaching of Islam. And it is a sign of hypocrisy. And as far as somebody giving a trust to you and asking you to keep up with something, this is really a big thing. If somebody has asked you, for instance, I would like to leave the keys to my car with you, or I trust you with some wealth of some kind, and I say, will you take care of this until I come back? But when I come back, you've betrayed the trust by selling the car to somebody else or damaging things or using them for your own use and that wasn't what it was for to start with. So keeping a trust is really, really important. Now, when we talk about that if a person makes a promise, this also is something very, very important in Islam, not something lightweight. Today I find a lot of Muslims making this mistake of thinking that a promise is not that big of a deal. And if you say, do you promise to do that? They say, yeah, I promise, inshallah. And inshallah means if God wills. So this is really adding to what you say, not taking away from it. So we should be real careful when we make a promise and realize that, especially if I say inshallah, this means in front of Allah, if there's any possible way, I'm going to keep my promise. And it's not something small if I tell you I'm going to meet you at 11 o'clock in the morning and I don't show up until 12 o'clock. That is not keeping a promise, is it? And this is something I find even from Muslims being very bad about this, thinking that's not a big deal. And yet it's a promise. And when you give a promise, you should keep it. But if you said, well, for instance, I live in Pakistan and people are always late. Or I live in Egypt. And I live in an Arabian country. We're always late. It's no big deal. No, it's a big deal. If you mean a certain time, say the time you mean. And if you come early and nobody else shows up, fine. You kept your promise. And the reason you do that, the reason you make a promise is for what reason? Because in front of a law, you're saying I'm going to do a certain thing to the best of my ability. And it means that you'll get a reward for that. As we mentioned earlier in our program about intentions. And I want to be rewarded. So even if you don't show up on time and I show up on time, I'm going to be rewarded for something. So this is all part of developing that good Muslim character. Now, as far as arguing, when he mentioned about arguing, have you ever noticed that some people, when they argue, they will use things that are not really a part of the argument? For instance, 
If I'm arguing with you about a subject of a color of something or tell you about how big something is, and we're just talking back and forth, no, I thought it was red, no, I thought it was so big, etc. But then I say, well, you're stupid. Well, now, you see, that has nothing to do with the subject, does it? We're talking about an object over here, and now suddenly I have accused you of something. Or I say, oh, people from your family or people from where you come from or, you know, this type of attitude is the kind of behavior that's being described by the Prophet وسلم, when he's talking about a person who argues in an insolent manner. This is exactly the kind of character we want to avoid when we develop the good Muslim character. It's important for us to remember that is a part of it too. How you behave with the people. And when you do have a discussion about a subject, even if you get into an argument, keep it at a level of more like a little debate as opposed to using this type of attitude or these ways. Now I want to move forward. And we found that the Prophet ﷺ, um, this is going to be on the authority of Abdullah ibn Omar ibn al-As, and he says that the Prophet ﷺ said to me, O Abdullah, do not be like so-and-so. He used to get up at night for the optional prayer, but he abandoned it later. This is a beautiful subject for me to talk about because this is a characteristic that I'm trying to build in myself. And I've been working on it for since I came to Islam. And that is to do this sunnah or way of Muhammad Wasallam. This beautiful way of a Muslim is to get up in the middle of the night when nobody is awake, just all by yourself, you know, and you wash up, and you might even like to put on something that smells nice. And I like to go ahead and put on my thobe and everything to, to look nice as though I was going to be in a meeting with somebody really important. And then in this privacy to make two rakahs, or two and two, or two and two and two, and then finally end it with one. And this is called the Kiyamaleo, or standing in the night prayer. This is so special for all of the Muslims, not just the Prophet, peace be upon him, but all the Muslims to get up and do this optional prayer. You might think, oh my gosh, this is too much. But try it. Just try it. And then when you do, start lightweight. Don't push yourself too heavy because this is what the Hadith is talking about. Don't be like so-and-so who started it and then gave it up. But that doesn't mean don't start it. If you said, well, I'm afraid I might give it up so I won't even start, then this is also the wrong intention. We can go back and look about the good intentions again. So get up in the night and try this. Just start out light. Just in, If you say, well, I just want to pray one. Well, that's, it's not wrong. You can just start with a one. It's called which, which means odd. And in that prayer, what you do when you're praying, after you do the rukur, or before it, depending on the methab. Hold your hands and start to pray to Allah and ask Him. Ask Him for whatever you want. And you'll be surprised because this is a time when the Prophet ﷺ told us that Allah is coming down close to the earth and taking these prayers direct. And so this is something important for all of us to do, to get up in the camel leo, to get up in the middle of the night and pray. Start easy. Pray two and then one. Or pray two and then two and then one. But whatever you do when you start it, don't stop. Even if you wake up and it's almost time for the Fajr to come in, go ahead and wash up and pray that. And then when the Fajr comes in, just go on to the masjid and then pray your prayers there for the morning prayer. Try your best to do that. Start tonight if you like. And when you do it, see what happens the next day. It really makes a big difference in your day. And I recall recently, this happened while we were filming these projects that we're doing right now, that I got up in the night and I did that. I was pretty tired, but I did it anyway. You know what happened? I woke up laughing. I was laughing when I woke up. I don't usually do that. But I was so happy when I woke up, and I know why, because I did that. And I hope I encouraged you to do the same. Inshallah. Now, this next one I'd like to mention is on the authority of Adi bin Hatim. He was one of, like me, a Christian who came into Islam. And he said that he heard that the Prophet wasallam, peace be upon him, said, guard yourself against the fire of hell, even if it's only with half of a date. And if you can't afford that, 
you should at least say a good word. Now, how in the world would you guard yourself against the fire of hell with a half of a date? <laughs> that sounds weird, doesn't it? He meant what? Charity. Charity. Because in giving charity, especially giving from the heart, this is so important for the Muslim. Because, again, we talk about the intention. You're giving what you have. And what if you said, I only have one date? Cut it in half and give half of it in charity. Because this shows something really sincere on your side. And it takes away from the fire of hell. Because charity is a very, very important part of being a Muslim. To develop the character of a Muslim, there are a number of things that we do. As you know, the first thing is to always make the shahada, la ilaha illallah. Establish the salah, we pray five times a day. But then it comes to this charity. There's zakah, which is a, an obligation charity we must pay every year. But then there's the extra charity, which is up to you. You can, from your heart, give what you can give, as much as you can. And what's nice is, in Islam, we know to give it to who? To those who are closest to you and your family, your closest, closest people who are in need. So charity begins at home. That's the teaching in Islam. It's a great characteristic of a Muslim, good character building, and that is to give even if it's a date or a half of a date because it's according to your means. But that's not where it stops. What about the one who says, well, you know what? I don't even have a half a date to give. We have nothing at all. And then he covered that too when he said, at least say a good word. Sometimes a person could come to you and they could say to you, you know, I need some help. Could you help us financially? You said, I don't even have a quarter. I have no money today. So he said, well, he doesn't want a half a date. He needs some money. You know what you can do? Give him a good word of encouragement and tell him to ask Allah because that's a good word. Tell him, ask Allah, make dua, and I'll make dua for you. And encourage him with these good words. And that's a good way to do this act of charity as well. Now, we're going to wind up this program by going back to the very beginning of it and tell you that it's all by intention. So make good intentions in your heart and come from there. Until next time, this is Yusuf Estes telling you that we should always work on building a good Muslim character and having the way of the real Muslim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.